We're here for the science, not so much for the cocktails. Um, the project is not really about alcohol, but happy to be here. So I'm Tanya, that's Dan, in case this wasn't totally clear. And so we're talking about communications and what this has to do with quantum computers and what the problems are. So to give a short background of cryptography, so that's the science that we're both working in. And what we want to do is send messages. So here we have our senders, Jefferson and Madison, uh, whom you might remember from the time of American independence. So they are plotting to get rid of the occupation. So they are Americans and the British are there. And so they are under constant surveillance because, well, if they succeed, then there might be an independent state and no longer a UK dependent um, uh, country. So. Then there's a transmission where Jefferson sends something, and well, these are the modern day spies. So you have the NSA listening in, you have Verizon listening in. So they transmit your data, they are your carrier, and they see everything that goes across the wire. And well, also the agencies do see everything and store everything. <clears throat> so the meaning of cryptography is from the ancient Greek, means secret writing. And so what we want to do is we take whatever message Jefferson sends to Madison and do some transformations on it so that any eavesdropper in the middle who's very curious but cannot make sense out of what's going on over the wire. Now, you might go like, well, cryptography, why does this concern me? So if you're using a browser and then you click on the symbol, let me zoom in a little bit, so you click on the symbol up there and then you can see what is going on. There's something about verification, there's something about security, and here is encryption. And then down here are some magic words. When you say three-letter three initials, then you're invoking some uh, cipher gods, and it's going to be magically secure. So we're going to talk a little bit about these uh, three-letter abbreviations, which make your life a little more secure. So there's ASGCM, there's ECDH and RSA. But let me hand it over to Dan here to give a little background on the details. OK, so, oops, am I on? Testing, testing, do a button here. Try now. Am I on? Nope. Not on. I see it going flickering red, red, red. That means battery might be low. My bad, my bad, I'm sorry. OK, testing. Should it be on? No. It is on. Yeah, yours is on. Can you try again? Testing, testing. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. So I don't have to steal her microphone. That would make things more complicated. So what's going on inside this stuff? Well, one example of what we do in cryptography is secret key encryption. So saying secret key, that means that Jefferson and Madison on both ends of this communication, they know some secret which they're not showing anybody. So the eavesdropper, that's Eve, that's NSA and Verizon. Um, the eavesdropper, Eve, doesn't know this secret key. Only Jefferson and Madison know it. Now, it's maybe a little hard to see. On the left here is the Declaration of Independence. That's some subversive document that these people want to send to each other. And then, well, what's here is just totally random looking data. So that's what this key is doing, is it's transforming whatever message Jefferson wants to send into some random looking data. And that's all that the eavesdroppers in the middle get to see. And then at the other end, somehow, Madison gets to unscramble this, gets to take this scrambled message, and then using the key somehow undo that scrambling and turn it back into the Declaration of Independence. OK, so main goal here, first of all, is confidentiality, that the eavesdroppers can't figure out anything about what message was being sent. Maybe they could see some metadata, like what time you were sending a message and maybe who you were talking to, but at least they won't be able to figure out what the contents of the, of the message are. There's also another goal, which is integrity. Now this is, suppose that NSA wants to change the message that Jefferson is sending to Madison. And you can see how that could do quite a lot of damage if somebody is able to change the messages that, that you're receiving. And well, integrity means that the 
message that's getting through to, to Madison here, if the eavesdropper changes it somehow, then whatever happens, so this change from, from the original message to some red message here, then somehow this key is gonna figure out that no, that wasn't the legitimate message. And Madison's gonna see, no, that's not legitimate. There's more data flows, more complicated data flows that we look at in cryptography. For example, public key signatures. So here what's happening is that there's a secret key, but only Jefferson has this secret key. There's no longer a secret key for, for Madison. And Jefferson somehow uses this secret key and again scrambles the Declaration of Independence into something that looks like random garbage. And then, well, there's another thing here. This looks like some sort of seal, which Jefferson figures out from the secret key. And everybody can look at this seal, this public key. So Jefferson has a secret key and a public key. And then Madison, well, Madison takes the scrambled message and the public key and figures out that, yeah, it's the Declaration of Independence. And anybody who tries to change this, this message, if the eavesdropper tries to, to change the message into some different message, then again, Madison's gonna say, no, that's not a legitimate message. That's not, uh, that's not what was sent through. There's no secret key on Madison's side. In fact, anybody can look at the same message and look at the same public key and verify that it was a legitimate Declaration of Independence signed by Jefferson. And that's what this transformation is doing, taking this secret key, taking the message and converting it into some scrambled message, whatever mathematical transformation's happening there, that's guaranteeing that nobody other than Jefferson could have created this scrambled message. Anybody who calculates using the public key and the scrambled message calculates a declaration of independence can be assured that nobody other than Jefferson could have uh, scrambled a message in that way. Okay, so that's integrity again, that if a message is changed, then Madison will figure it out and say, no, that's not legitimate. And one more example of how complicated things get, this is called public key authenticated encryption. And what's happening here is that both sides have secret keys. You see a secret key here for Jefferson, and maybe it's a little hard to see, there's a silverish secret key here for, for Madison. Both of them have public keys, which they tell to everybody. So Jefferson has his public key, Madison has his public key. And then somehow Jefferson using Jefferson's secret key and Madison's public key can take the Declaration of Independence and turn it into this cipher text, this scrambled message, which when Madison receives it, Madison can somehow use Madison's secret key and Jefferson's public key and then figure out the original message. And this is something which protects the confidentiality of messages, so somebody can't, the eavesdropper can't figure out what the messages meant, and it protects the integrity of messages, it protects against the um, eavesdropper changing messages. The, the big difference between this and the original system is that, well, there's secret keys which you don't have to share in advance. You just have to have public keys that somehow everybody has to know, but you don't have to keep those public keys secret. Everybody just has his own secrets, and that's easier to, to maintain than um, keeping shared secrets secret. All right, I mean, we're telling these things here because this is a science lecture, but in the end, you don't want to have anything to do with this. You want to be using this. This is still your slide. It, this is still my slide. Oh yeah, there's more stuff that happens in crypto. Okay, yeah. back to time. <laughs> All right, so you want to use crypto whenever you have any communication. You don't want to be concerned about, well, is this going to be an interesting message? Is this an interesting message now? Is it going to be an interesting message in 15 years when the government has changed to something evil? You just want to have that every message is encrypted. And in some sense, when you're making a phone call, you want to make sure that your data, well, your, your billing and so on are located to you and not to somebody else. So there's a little bit of security on mobile phones. The security is not great, but at least there's something. And you don't need to bother with this. Your phone does it when it connects to the cell tower. It says, hi, I'm a phone. I have a Unotel or whatever is a proper number here. Um, and then it just communicates. Or you have a credit card, you have a bank account, you're using online banking. All of those things implicitly use cryptography. I was using this browser example before. What is in this list of things is all the three 
categories that Dan was showing. There's some signature, there's some symmetric cryptography, and there's some Diffie-Hellman, it was this complicated data flow where this way is the same as this way. Um, also, if you're having an iPhone, then you might have a more recent one, and by default, you have encryption going on there. It's something that, well, if you lose the phone, nobody should have your data. It's bad enough that you lose the hardware, but at least nobody gets your family pictures or gets to see all the secrets that you noted there, like, hmm, well, my bank account pin, my other password, my whatever. So it's bad enough to lose the hardware, and they shouldn't get the data. So that's the idea of having like encrypted file systems. Interestingly, with the Apple versus FBI, this, of course, got now again the terrorist spin that, oh, yeah, only bad people encrypt. Actually, uh, for iPhone, it's on by default. For Android, you have to do a little work, but it's also very easy. It's just saying a click. You don't need to know all these data flows. It's good if you know, because it tells you a little bit like what's going on behind the scenes, makes you a little more comfortable. You can choose things, but in the end, we want to have usable things. Um, if you're using WhatsApp, there was a news item two weeks ago um, that WhatsApp is now using proper encryption by default. If you go a little bit further and actually want to use cryptography, then you might have decided to download PGP. This is one of the oldest mail encryption systems. Um, I would recommend if you're having a cell phone uh, for both Android or um, iPhone, you can download Signal, which is a free app and does encrypted messages, encrypted calls. So this is super easy to use and just does everything encrypted. The only thing is, well, at some point you have to figure out what your partner's public key is. So at some point you have to look up Jefferson's coat of arms and that's usually something the party who gives you his phone number will also be able to say, hey, oh yeah, that's actually me. And then if you're going a little more further, when you want to have anonymous browsing, you can use Tor. If you want to have an operating system that is a little nicer if you're crossing a border, use Tails. And then also Cubes, which is um, highly compartmented. So if you're going into more concerned, well, you could say paranoia, but many people think paranoia is a bad word. We think paranoia is a good word. So if you're going into the positive sense of paranoia, download Cubes and use it. Um, Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean NSA is not recording everything. <laughs> Also, you might say, well, I don't care. I have nothing to hide. Why should I go through all this extra effort? I mean, iPhone is making it easy to me, but why would I bother to download things? Why should I care about my privacy? And then Snowden had a, a very nice answer to this one, which I just would like to read out, saying, arguing that you don't care about the right to privacy because you have nothing to hide is no different than saying that you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. So cryptographic tools, we mentioned already public key encryption, public key signatures, and so they have different, different areas what they cover, so authenticity, integrity, and um, encryption also has the confidentiality. When you look at what the icon tells you, then the things that you very commonly see is going to be RSA, it's going to be ECDH or DH, so the DH diagram was this big data flow that I had on the slide, um, so you're going to see lots of those things, and you're going to see those names again on later slides. So elliptic curve, Diffie-Hellman, normal Diffie-Hellman fine fields, and RSA are the big ones. And there's also something like AES or Chacha. Now, many of those are pretty nice. The internet is moving over to some crypto that, well, then designed. So there's curve to 517 on every iPhone, um, and we have... Uh, currently ongoing a motion to actually get it also deployed in your browsers. This is crypto which is a little more recent, more secure, easier to get right. So in, in many ways, the internet is getting better. Um, <coughs> then again, if you see that Apple versus FBI, that the FBI was still able to get into the phone, there are lots of security problems out there. It's usually not the crypto that breaks. It's usually something around it. So um, it's bad enough to to have such issues, we really don't need any legislation that makes life harder. So, so for instance, in the UK, that is currently discussing what is called the snooper charter, and that would mean that you have to have backdoors. We don't even know how to make a system really secure without backdoors, and it's pretty much impossible to get it right with backdoors. Well, and that was a happy part of the talk. <laughs> okay, so... That last picture 
Maybe we'll go back to that for a moment. <laughs> this is the coming of quantum computers. Even if crypto were going perfectly today, there's this threat on the horizon, which is that at some point, if somebody builds a big universal quantum computer, then they're going to factor all of the RSA keys you might use. They're going to break all the ECC keys that you might use. This picture, for those of you who don't recognize it, is a mathematician named Peter Shore, who wrote this <laughs> paper uh, back in the 1990s called Algorithms for Quantum Computation, Discrete Logarithms and Factoring. And what this paper is saying is that if you have a big quantum computer, then you can factor big numbers. And you can compute discrete logs, which is, it means you can break ECDH, you can break DSA, you can break various other acronyms for these public key systems that people are using all the time. And then, well, just because somebody says, if you have a big quantum computer, then you can do this, doesn't mean you can do this. The big question there is, do you have a big quantum computer? Well, if you follow the news, then you might have seen uh, D-Wave advertising, like, yes, we have a quantum computer, and they're going for thousands of qubits, and they also got some awards at supercomputing conferences. Um, well, it's certainly not what we call a universal quantum computer. A universal quantum computer, for one thing, can run short. Um, the D-Wave quantum computer is not able to actually store, so if you're familiar with normal computers, then we talk about bits, and then on a quantum computer, well, you make those, call these things qubits. And the qubits have some physical realization which has a problem that they decay. So you think you're storing some data there, and you look a moment later, it's still there. And at some point, well, it has kind of grayed out. You don't really know what's there anymore. At some point, it's gone. And usually what we need to have happen is that you do some enhancements, some error corrections, so that your status, your qubits are stable. But for uh, the D-Wave quantum computer, you don't have stable qubits. You can't do normal qubit operations. You can't, totally can't run the Shor's algorithm. So you can't really do anything that we are, well, care about or I would say are afraid of. Um, also, it is, hasn't really done anything that would justify the price. <laughs> we spoke with some NSA people and they were like, yeah, well, um, we're glad that our agency didn't buy one. We got some 100,000 worth of time on it. We don't really know what to run on it. Hasn't even done anything to justify like a 1% of the price. But that doesn't mean that it's all happy and we're like, okay, well, they're not coming. What have they done so far? Fact that 15 and there's D-Wave, so we're good, right? Um, it will happen eventually. So if you look at other companies, companies that are having a reputation to lose and are big players in the current silicon market, so you have IBM, you have Intel, you have Google and Microsoft, they are actually investing in quantum computing. They're investing in technology to build it. They're investing in technology to run software on it after once it's built, and so, if you look at like the progress, what's happening there, there's things going on, and it's not the records of how many bits are broken, it's how long can you keep something stable, how many qubits can you have, and how good is your error correction. And if those two things come together, then you have this whole range where you suddenly have a big quantum computer which can actually do shore and scale stuff. So Mark Ketchen, who's with IBM, said in an interview in 2012 that he's actually thinking it's, it's within reach, it's something that is like 10, 15 years from now. Now, let's forward 10, 15 years, so 2022 or 2027, and we now have a big quantum computer. What are the effects on crypto? So all the things that we just saw as the main things, RSA, dead. Diffie Hellman, dead. Elliptic curve discrete lock, dead. And okay, these are the Diffie Hellman things that we saw on the previous slide. So this breaks every public key cryptography on the internet. And public key was what we needed in order to have that they can look up this coat of arms, that they don't have to meet and agree on a secret key in private. So there's another algorithm. There's not just Shaw, there's also an algorithm due to Grover. Um, in many ways, it's the more important algorithm for what we, what we are now doing as scientists, because it's more widely applicable, but it's not as catastrophic. So it takes this AS that was mentioned as an example of symmetric cryptography and takes it from something which would be 2 to the 128 to break 
and brings it down to 2 to the 64. Now, these are both unbelievably big numbers, but this is a lot less big than this one. We usually want to have something which is 2 to the 128 because it's huge. This is the level of hugeness that we're comfortable with. But the nice thing about AS is, well, there's another variant. We can just go for 256-bit, and that then has 128 security after Grover. So Grover does something we need to take it into account, but it's not as catastrophic. OK, so what kind of solutions are there for the public key side, for the, for the secret key AES side? OK, go up to AES-256, but what about RSA being dead and DSA being dead and ECDSA being dead? Well, one answer to this is go back to the Dark Ages. Now, the Dark Ages used what you might call physical cryptography. So examples of this are locked briefcase cryptography, quantum cryptography, in particular quantum key distribution. These are things where you can communicate secrets and not just keep them confidential, but also protect the integrity, make sure nobody's changing them, by, for example, take three copies of the document and send them through three trusted couriers with these locked briefcases chained to their wrists, and then anybody who, even if somebody corrupts one courier, okay, they'll be able to see the message, but they won't be able to change it because you get the other two copies. You, you can do these super expensive physical techniques to protect your information, and you can even deal with the, what I just said about one courier being able to break confidentiality. You can split messages in a way that no single courier can break the confidentiality. There's all sorts of interesting techniques for rich people to protect their information. And this is physical cryptography. Now, these uh, ways of protecting information, sometimes people will say that they're provably secure, um, where they actually sometimes even write down a proof theorem you cannot figure out what's inside the locked briefcase, assuming that you can't open the locked briefcase and you can't use x-rays and et cetera, et cetera. And while well, there's these assumptions that people make to try to justify spending huge amounts of money, if you're like a Swiss bank and you wanna uh, spend money on physical protection of your information, then there's actually papers which will say, yeah, 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 here's some assumptions which guarantee that your system is secure. And, well, the problem is that those assumptions are wrong. And people are breaking these systems again and again and again, even though it sounds good. Yeah, there's these three couriers. Well, there's all sorts of ways to compromise all three couriers. And there's lots and lots of other flaws in these systems, ways that the, the security of these systems fails. So physical cryptography ends up failing in lots of ways that mathematical <laughs> cryptography doesn't. Realistically, even if you got past all of the problems with these uh, assumptions, then you'd still have a system where it's really, really hard to get it right, and really hard to convince anybody that you've gotten it right. And whoever's building your briefcases can put a little camera in there without your noticing. It's really easy for somebody to backdoor the, the system. It's much, much harder for somebody to, to backdoor software. If it's open source software that lots of people are looking at, then it's, it's much easier for us to tell that, yeah, the, the software is done correctly. These physical cryptographic techniques, they have a really bad track record of being compromised. And finally, even if physical cryptography actually did everything it was supposed to do, and even if we were somehow magically confident in the security, well, it wouldn't do basic stuff that we need, like public key signatures. It really only does, you have somebody that you, you've already set up some sort of secret or trusted communication mechanism with them and then you want to exchange messages. It doesn't let you do things like operating system updates, where you download a new version of your operating system or a new version of an app and you have to, your, your computer, your smartphone checks a signature on that to make sure that it's valid. And that's the sort of thing, imagine Microsoft sending out billions of couriers with locked briefcases so that each of you, if you're using Microsoft, use Linux, it's better. But anyway, uh, wherever you're getting your operating system from, imagine every week you have a, a courier coming to your house with a locked briefcase to deliver your OS update. Just doesn't work. Or you have to fly to Seattle. Well, is there any hope? Is there anybody who know some answer well, so um, cryptography doesn't consist only of RSA and ECC and Diffie Hellman. Um, back in 2003, Dan, this Dan here, coined the term post-quantum cryptography as cryptography that takes into account um, that quantum computers might exist, that the attacker has a quantum computer. 
So how can we still defend ourselves against such an attacker? And then um, together, and together with some other people, we organized the first conference on post-quantum cryptography back in 2006. And then this actually, this okay. actually took off. Okay, I guess I'm supposed to uh, point to some more conferences. So they started on a, well, year and a half schedule, Peak of Crypto 2008, and then 2010, and wow, thanks for clicking, 2011, 13, 14, and more and more people coming to these conferences. And then, all right, by 2015, last year, uh, the European Union finally decided that this is actually an important enough topic to actually fund researchers to figure out, all right, how do we actually get this stuff integrated into real applications? What can we do? Well, the title of the project is Post-Quantum Cryptography for Long-Term Security. That's what was mentioned at the beginning as this big project that Tanya's running with, what is it, 11 partners? Um, so two industry partners and a bunch of universities from around Europe and some uh, cooperating people from Including Asia. Including DTU in Denmark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, okay, you can advertise the project. Um, yeah, so, so a big project with lots of people, the big players working on post-quantum crypto and actually getting it deployed in, in the real world. So that should be done by 2018. Did we miss anybody? Yeah. There's, uh, <laughs> right, it's not just Dan and me doing something. Also, the NSA uh, last summer said, oh yeah, uh, we have to do something. IED, which is the Information Assurance Directorate, uh, recognizes that there will be a move in the not too distant future to a quantum resistant algorithm suite. Somehow. We don't know how it would happen, but we recognize it will happen. Um, this was their first announcement on the 11th of August, and I guess somebody told them that this maybe was not so good for PR. So for some magic reason, eight days later, they, they changed the text. <coughs> saying, aha, IED will initiate a transition to quantum resistant algorithms in the not too distant future. So suddenly NSA, the IDA, the Information Director, uh, Assurance Director, is at the forefront of the move and they will do something. We haven't really seen them doing much, but they will do something. So somehow to me this is more like um, NSA comes late to the party and botches the entrance. <laughs> well, let, let's look at what the party is continuing. Okay, so 2016 in February, there were all of the people shown here showing up at the Post-Quantum Cryptography 2016 conference in Fukuoka. And then one of the events that happened there was NIST, the US National Institute of Standards and Technology, which standardized, for example, AAS, result of a big competition. They said, all right, they'd like submissions of possible post-quantum standards, and uh, then they'll consider what to do and spend some years working it out and getting more feedback from the community. So that's just getting kicked off uh, this year and, and submissions will be next year. And then coming up in 2017 will be the next conference. There's been an agreement to speed it up to every year. So in Utrecht in the Netherlands will be PQ Crypto 2017. So if you like this talk and want to see more, there will be a whole conference and we're gonna have a whole week of summer school as well. She's not saying we're done yet. <laughs> no, no, no. Well, now, one of the problems, I mean, um, the reason I can't spend the four million on cocktails is that we actually need to do some work. Um, if you think about, we've been presenting all these crypto systems as, yeah, all this stuff exists, and then you go back to the textbooks or Wikipedia pages and you find out about what I've been telling you so far. I mentioned RSA, well, that's from 77. I mentioned diffie Hellman, it's from 76. I mentioned Elliptic Curse, it's from 85. We're only doing old stuff. Well, there's actually a reason. In crypto, we're very concerned with deploying things. There's a lot of suspicion. Is this really secure? Did anybody overlook something? Is it maybe even a malicious proposal? Is somebody trying to sell us something where they know more than we do, and they're trying to trap us into something that they can break and we don't? So in general, there's this feeling of, OK, uh, every new system is met with a lot of suspicion. So there's a lot of time that it takes to build confidence. For some systems, it maybe took a little longer than absolutely necessary because, well, something else was already running, but it's not a process that you can do from, from overnight. So, in principle, like, you come up with your favorite math problem that you always found hard, and at some point you realize it's not just you not liking it, but it's actually a problem that other people have studied and say, well, there are no efficient algorithms. It's something that is fundamentally complicated. And then out of all these fundamentally complicated problems, you're trying to build a crypto system. It's not just because it's hard to do something <laughs> that you can just turn it into something where you can sign or 
encrypt with it. And many systems, when you look at, well, the early 80s and so on, there were lots of systems, Google for knapsack systems, which were based on hard problems, but then the crypto systems built on them was turning out to be totally weak. Because you need to be able to not just encrypt, but also decrypt. And then you explore in this whole world, and then at some point you have something which looks secure, and then goes like, can you actually use this? Can you actually implement that? So then you go like, how big is your key? How efficient is this? Does it fit on a smart card or do you need a supercomputer to do this? And so then we get into like the more real world application. Does it fit into our normal ping pong of messages? Or is there something that Jefferson and Madison need to know before they can start talking? Do they need to remember something? Uh, can we put this on an iPhone and such things? And so it takes a long time, elliptic curves. So this is my favorite example of something which maybe took a little too long. The curves are from 85. Um, there was a reasonable standard proposed in 2005, but it's basically like the last few years, so more like 2015, that we see widespread adoption. So on the internet, getting better elliptic curves, curve 25519 from Dan, that is last year. So that's 30 years ago. So if we think it takes that long, then we can't wait till, well, 12 years from now, quantum computers exist. We can't wait that long till we start doing the work. If you've forgotten what the 80s looked like, <laughs> that's how long ago elliptic curves are. <coughs> and in many, in many ways, it's actually worse than that. If today you're encrypting a message, and this message goes from you over the internet to somebody else, and this is encrypted, then it's going to be stored in one of those points. X key score was marking all the interception points where they're taking the messages and filtering. And one of the filters that they apply is, well, is this message encrypted? If it's encrypted, it's interesting. That's stored in Bluffdale. So we used to give talks about crypto for the paranoid, where we're worrying that maybe somebody stores your messages and then can go back and then later on decrypt. Nowadays, we know that somebody is storing our messages. And then the issue is, if today you have elliptic curves, which we know are broken by quantum computer, but are totally fine now, you have your elliptic curve com uh, communication going like, hey, I'm going to science and cocktails. Awesome. Glad you're here. So you send this to your friend. Somehow this gets intercepted because, well, it's encrypted. And then 20 years from now, the whoever is running Denmark by then, government has turned evil and owns a quantum computer, and maybe has outlawed Christiania. God behave, it won't happen. Um, but let's assume that suddenly Christiania is something evil. Then it's suddenly something that matters to you that you have sent this message, oh, I'm going to science and cocktails. And they go back to the 17th of April, um, six, 16th. 16th of April, 2016, and find out what your message was. And then retroactively can go back in time and find out what you sent. So, well, I don't expect that Denmark is going to turn evil, and I hope you all will work on that not happening. But if you're a human rights activist, if you're a lawyer, if you're out as a journalist, you are already in regions where your current government is rogue or is very, very interested in what you're sending. And they might have enough, data to, uh, enough storage for data to remember what you sent. So it's not enough that we start deploying secure, uh, secure communication post-quantum secure communication once the quantum computer is there, but we actually would need it already today, because today you're sending your message with something which will be broken once the quantum computer is there. Okay, so what do the post-quantum solutions look like? We have a, a few examples to dive into just a little bit of detail. Um, let's start out with what does it look like doing authenticated encryption using a secret key? So suppose that you do have, somehow you've met in the woods somewhere and shared a key secretly with somebody, or maybe more realistically, you have a, a USB stick, and then your USB stick you put on, say, 128 gigs of data, completely random data, and then you have a copy on your computer, and your friend, you give the USB stick to your friend, your friend has a copy on their computer, and then you burn the USB stick at that point, overwrite the data, and then, okay, you've got some shared secret, a whole lot of random data that both sides know, if you can afford to meet and share that secret. Then what do we do in the post-quantum world to protect against 
quantum computers. Well, this is something where we have confidence-inspiring solutions. Like Tanya was mentioning earlier that AES, you can pump up to AES 256. But let me look at, at a little more of, of what's going on inside that. If you have a whole big long string of random bits and you want to encrypt a message, what you can do is you can just XOR, exclusive OR, the bits with your message. So you can take, if there's a, a zero bit in your message and you have a zero bit in your pad, your secret, shared secret, then you put together a zero as your ciphertext. And if you have a zero and a one, you put a one, one and zero, you put a one, one and one, you put a zero. And that's something that the other side can undo and it completely protects the confidentiality of your, of your data. And there's also something which I won't explain called a Wegman Carter Mac, which gives you the same guaranteed integrity, gives you the same absolute confidence that if you have a whole lot of random data, which is a big if, then you can protect the integrity of your messages as well. You can authenticate your messages. And then what is AES doing? Well, fundamentally, AES, this, this block cipher that's standardized, AES takes a 128 or 256 bit key, depending what the number is there. AES 256 takes a 256 bit key and it somehow churns along for a while and turns that key into what you would have had on your USB stick if you exchanged 128 gigs or any amount of data you wanted. And this AES-256, well, this is something lots of people have looked at, and it seems that nobody can figure out anything in the outputs that's different from completely random data. If you feed in a, a random 256-bit key and look at the outputs, then it looks totally random, and it's, it's as long as you want, you can use it to encrypt as, as much of a message as you want. And this is something which has been around since 1998. AES has almost 20 years of, of study, lots and lots of cryptanalysts looking at it, and the best quantum attacks we know are this Grover attack that Tanya mentioned earlier, which takes two to the 128 quantum operations to figure anything out about your 256-bit secret key. And that two to the 128 is a gigantic number. We're not gonna do that many computations. What about using public keys? Well, here, the solution that's been around for the longest is what's called code-based cryptography, specifically the McLeese crypto system. So the data flow here, this was something that is sort of part of uh, the, the most complicated picture we had before. What's going on here is Madison has a secret key and publishes this coat of arms, this seal, this public key for everybody to look at. And then Jefferson, or anybody else who wants to send a message securely to Madison, Jefferson uses the message and the public key to create a ciphertext, which then gets sent along through the eavesdroppers to Madison. And Madison, using his secret key, can decrypt the message. Now, how do we do this post-quantum? Well, this McLeese system is using some topic called coding theory, which is the same theory that's used to, for example, stop your CDs from being ruined by a scratch. Okay, okay, CDs are kind of old-fashioned, but slightly more modern example, DVDs? DVDs, anybody remember DVDs? Okay, okay, here's a real example. Satellite communication. We have satellites, and a lot of times the data that you're sending to satellites kind of drops out, there's fuzz on it, there's interference, atmospheric interference, and so on. And what happens is you take the data you want to send to the satellite, and simple thing you could do is repeat the data like three times. And then if one of them gets fuzzed, then okay, you've got the other two copies and you can figure out what happened. And then coding theory looks at all sorts of more sophisticated mathematical things you can do to take a message and somehow encode it, convert it into a longer message in a way that resists somebody having uh, errors corrupt the message. And then these GAPA codes are some fancy mathematical tool which, is, which are really, really good at um, taking a, a, a message and converting it into an encoded message in a way that if there's some errors, then you can undo that. And what McLeese said was, hey, if you, if you use these GAPA codes, then you can actually use that as a, as a public key encryption system, where Madison, his secret key is a GAPA code, the secret decoder that somehow takes a, an encoded message with some errors in it and figures out what those errors are. And the trick to use the public key, the public key is some sort of description of how you can encode, which doesn't tell you how to decode. And then Jefferson takes that public key and says, okay, I'm gonna take a message, I'm gonna encode it, and then I'll just flip some bits. And then 
the whole point of coding theory is that Madison can then undo those flips, can figure out which bits were flipped and recover the original message. But that's something that seems really hard to do just using the public key. It's something that requires knowing the secret key. So that's the, the McLeese system, which goes from 1978. And lots and lots and lots of people have, have looked at this. I think we have mm -hmm. one slide on uh, just some examples of some papers of people trying to uh, attack this system, including maybe I'll highlight a couple of papers which we've been involved with looking at what happens if you have a quantum computer, which does speed up the attacks, but not drastically so. If you use a bigger key, then, then you're safe. The bottom line for what it looks like using this system is some pretty big public keys. Everybody you want to send messages to, if you want, say, 2 to the 146 pre-quantum security, not thinking about a quantum computer yet, um, then a public key of 256 kilobytes is enough. Now, on the scale of your data plan where you might be limited to, say, gigabytes of data in a month, and then it starts slowing down depending on what kind of data plan you have, um, well, if you're sending around lots and lots of 256K or megabyte long chunks of data, that starts adding up. But if you don't have a huge number of people you're communicating with, then you can afford this. And then as data plans get better and better, then this will become more and more affordable. And also, the results of the analysis of, of uh, quantum computers is that the amount of computation, if you use these megabyte keys, the amount of computation the attacker has to do goes down from 2 to the 200 something, down to still 2 to the 100, very far beyond what somebody can actually uh, be expected to compute anytime soon. So we're confident in the security of the system, even against quantum computers. The downside is that every time you want to send somebody a message, you have to know their one megabyte public key. You can send them multiple messages, but each different person you want to send to, or every time somebody upgrades to a new key to throw away their old keys so that they can't decrypt the old messages anymore, um, every time somebody has a new key, you have to send a megabyte of data around. All right. So, so much for the post-quantum encryption. Um, you won't find this on your cell phone yet, but it's pretty much deployable. Depends on your use case, whether the megabyte is an issue. Let's look at signatures. So this was the data flow for a signature. This time the sender has a secret key and a public key, uses the secret key to add a signature to this message. And then anybody, including, well, Madison, but he could also go to a judge and say, hey, look, I got this. Is this still valid? Anybody taking the public key can verify this. Now, for signatures, there is no need to undo the operation. So for, for encryption, you kind of have to find an operation where you go one step forward by encrypting, and you have to go backwards using the secret key. So you have to have a trap door where you can go back only if you know the secret key. For signatures, it's a lot easier. This guy does the forward direction, and then the signature verification is also kind of the forward direction. It's just checking that something which was generated is correct. So in some ways, getting a signature system is easier. And um, for signatures, we also have something which is like conceptually very obviously secure against quantum computers, namely hash functions. So hash functions is something which appears throughout crypto. It's something which takes a long string and maps it to something short in a way so that you can't go back. And not just because it's smaller, but you can't possibly, well, with all normal computation, can't find anything that this comes from that expands it. So it should be really hard to invert function. And so if you use one of those functions where the long string is your secret and the short string is your public key, anybody can verify that it does this operation. If you at some point release this long thing, every computer can check, yes, that's the correct one. And so this is an idea that Lambert had in the 70s and said, hey, look, we have a signature scheme, but all it can do is can like, well, sign one bit. And once I've used the signature, I have to throw it away. It's a one-time signature. Once I've revealed the pre-image, well, it's out there. I can't use this one anymore. And then Merkle, ca Merkle came along, and you might have seen Merkle trees in, in file sharing, for instance, where you um, verify a fingerprint of a big file by taking lots of short downloads, because, well, your internet connection might not be good enough, so you're downloading your operating system or something, and then you get a piece. You might be 
doing a BitTorrent for getting Debian or something, or whatever else. Then the BitTorrent has all these pieces, and you verify the correctness of all those pieces by checking each of those, checking the combination, checking combination. You're going tree-wise down till you have, at the bottom, the root of the tree, and that's the thing you verify. Is this the same as was promised? Yep, then you got the correct file, and if not. And now what Merkle and Lampert together do is do lots of top leaves, and these are your signatures, these are your one-time signatures, and then you can go down the tree and have the public key down here. So if any of those is incorrect, you'll hash to something else. So this is like lots of finger wa hand waving, but this is the background of lamp post signatures or in general hash based signatures. Um, now, these are very obviously post quantum. We don't really know, other than Grover, anything that does a quantum computer can do against the hash function. So it's fairly easy to see it works. It's a uh, reason to write down. The public key that's this, just this bottom of this tree, that's fairly small. It's also reasonably fast, well, it depends on the size of the tree. Um, it has been proposed for standardization, so if you care about, say, what comes on the internet, then this might be coming to an internet near you soon, so this is how the standardization process works for, for internet cryptography. But in this tree, you need to remember where you were. If you ever use one of those again, well, you have already used this one, you have already published the secret for it, then you're in trouble. And so um, it's something which we call stateful. It's a problem because you need to remember where you are. And Adam Langley, who works for Google and does lots of that crypto, was saying, well, this is, for most environments, a huge foot cam. That means, well, if you're, for instance, Google, then you want to have a signature which you can have shared among different computers. You as a user don't care whether you're talking to Google Computer 1, 2, or 3. They should all be able to sign. But if they have to remember where in the tree they are, then Google Computer 1 has to tell Google Computer 2, oh, I have used this already. But they are concurrently, at the same time, using signatures. And so, well, this is one of the reasons, well, one of the cases where, you, as a scientist, you can say, we need to eliminate the state. So. There is a lot of theory going in there. I have a slide just to scare you a little bit, and I was also told that some people want to be scared, so well, this is the scary slide. So we're not just gonna take one tree, we're gonna do a tree of trees. That's how you build those things. And um, down here you have your signatures, and up there you have your public key, and then you have to do all kinds of little things. Um, what comes out of this, at least the good ones, well, this is the not so good one, 0.6 megabyte is a little too big. We brought it down to 0.041, so 41 kilobytes, and have a proposal called Sphinx. It's an optimization of this big idea of where you have like all these little trees running around. Um, this is something which we designed for post-quantum crypto. It has, um, all components have 2 to the 128 post-quantum security, so, well, almost twice as much pre-quantum security. And this is pretty much ready, so if anybody needs signatures, then we can offer that one. Okay, so in the uh, second half of the talk, we decided that we'd dig into more detail about a bunch of other possible... Uh, just kidding, just kidding. There's lots of other... <laughs> Lots of other ideas that people have had for how you can do post-quantum cryptography. And, I mean, there's all sorts of buzzwords, and there's some interesting things happening. There's just one of these that I'll highlight for a moment, which is that there was a proposal in 2009 by Nigel Smart and Fravor Caltron, where they said, here's a, a perfectly reasonable public key encryption system, which looks like it's using standard kind of techniques, and it's post-quantum, and has some extra features. And then, five years later, which in cryptographic timescales is not that long. Five years later, it was shown that there's a quantum attack which totally breaks the system. So assuming you have a quantum computer, like Shore assumes, then this system is, is just not secure at all. Uh, Pre-quantum, it's, it's maybe not so bad, but post-quantum, it, it definitely doesn't hold up. And this is just an example of how we have to be really careful that any new proposals for, for instance, oh, could we do public key encryption with much smaller keys by the following idea? Well, there's lots of interesting ideas, and it's really important important to get enough cryptanalysis and make sure that, that we've actually studied, do these ideas work, are they, are they secure? Well, 
All right, so as the final slide, we have further resources. So if you like what you've seen here, of course, please come to the summer school next year in Utrecht. Um, but until then, to entertain you, you can um, get much more information about this EU project. So we have um, lots of talks at different levels, some with videos even on our homepage. Dan and I maintain a survey site where we try to have a general list of papers on post-quantum. It's currently not as up-to-date as we want, so if your favorite paper is missing, please email us, ideally with the full bibliographic information. We'll put it there. And uh, the last Pika Crypto was very good about videotaping everything, and they're slowly putting stuff out on YouTube. So check back there if you want to have like details about coding theory. I gave an hour and a half on coding theory. A colleague of mine gave an hour and a half on hash-based. So there was no way we could squeeze all of this into this talk, but if you felt like, okay, you get a little bit and you want to learn more, please go and visit those, those sites. Also, many more um, general crypto links. Um, do you want to do something about the FBI thing? Well, okay, okay. If you haven't had a chance to see it, John Oliver's segment on last week tonight about encryption from about a month ago. It was about a week before there was supposed to be the big Apple FBI hearing. And he did this wonderful segment about Apple, including he made up an advertisement for Apple where he was saying how, yeah, they try to portray themselves as being really on top of the security picture, but the reality is they're just barely staying one step ahead of the attackers. And he ended off this fake commercial with saying uh, from Apple, join us in dancing madly on the lip of the volcano, which I think is a, a good metaphor for what's happening in crypto generally. And with that, well, that's it. Thank you for your attention.